The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today's gospel reading is one of those where I end up going, the gospel of the Lord, and I'm thinking, but is it? <laughs> it brings with it some pretty big challenges and some hard words to hear. In this particular, in a section of this passage um, that uh, our own translators have labeled, now in the original scripts of the Bible, there weren't sections and subsections, so we've kind of added in our own. But um, those who translated this part of Matthew dubbed this one particular section the cost of discipleship. And Jesus says this about the cost of discipleship. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. So, what about all that prophecy in the Old Testament about this Messiah who is going to come and be the Prince of Peace? Right? This Prince of Peace is entering the world. And just before this part of the text that we read, we also read Jesus telling them, have no fear. And then in the end of the Gospels, after Jesus is risen and he appears to the disciples, he breathes on them and says to them, peace be with you, my peace I give to you. And so now how is it that we have to read this part of the Gospel? the gospel, and I have to proclaim the gospel of the Lord when it does not sound like good news to me. And Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace. And yet, when we really look at this gospel message, the good news, what Jesus has done has come to upset the apple cart a little, so to speak. What Jesus has come for does bring division. Because in bringing peace, Christ has come to reframe the law and to fulfill it, which sometimes becomes a little complicated and brings division. So what does this mean, reframe the law or fulfill it? If we go back in the very beginning of the Bible, we read the passage um, in the second or third chapter of Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned. And the punishment for that sin is death. We read the, the, the passage, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And at Ash Wednesday, we hear those words repeated, because we know that we will die because of sin. 
And so then the Ten Commandments are given and the people of Israel come to be and they are to follow God and they do for a while and then they kind of lose patience and fall off the wagon and do all these things they're not supposed to do and God um, punishes them and then forgives them and then we start the whole cycle over and over and over through the Old Testament until finally God comes to Jeremiah for a new prophecy because God's like, hmm, this doesn't seem to be working. Um, they can't seem to live by the law. So I'm going to make a new covenant. God says, I'm going to make a new covenant and it will be in their hearts and they will be my people and I will be their God. And so then we come to the gospel, this fulfillment of that prophecy where Jesus comes to fulfill the law, to do the law for us since we are unable. And God gives us grace because he knows that we can't always fulfill the law. And then finally, Paul writes in Romans and some of his other letters that it's not our own fulfilling of the law that saves us, it is God's grace that saves us, what God has done for us. So not all of the things that we do, but God's grace. Now, that's what it means to think about reframing the law a little bit, to think about the new covenant. What does that actually look like? In Jesus' day, it may have looked a little like this. Some of the leaders of the temple continued to live out the letter of the law without considering the spirit of the law. So Jesus turns it upside down and questions what living of the law truly looks like. He kind of tips the hierarchy and puts everyone on level ground and uses examples such as healing on the Sabbath when you weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath, but healing should still happen. And he talks with those who are unclean. Most people aren't supposed to associate with them, but Jesus does. Jesus opens up God's love to those who are not typically considered God's people, God's chosen people. So the Gentiles, the unbelievers. And Jesus does things like turn the tables in the temple. And those tables were selling things that people were supposed to go into worship to uh, take with them so that they could make amends for their sinfulness. But this is where Jesus brings to life the words of the prophet Micah. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. It's not about here's the, here's the rule, here's what you do, now you're good, here's the rule, and you just keep going in the cycle. But it's a reminder that because of what God has done, then we do justice and love kindness and walk humbly, and that's true worship. Jesus doesn't abolish the law by any means, but Jesus looks at it differently. Jesus interprets it differently. As Paul writes in Romans, it's not about forgetting the law and doing whatever we want. What shall we say then? Shall I keep on sinning? No. But remembering what the law is for and who is the, really the one that saves us. Jesus begs us to question what real love and service look like in laying his life down for us, in the washing of the feet of the disciples, for allowing a woman who has sinned relief from her sentence of being stoned to death because all of those who are going to stone her are also guilty of sin. Jesus calls the people to question what God's love and covenant are really all about. And in doing this, it causes people to question how much is too much? What is too much interpretation of the law? What is not fulfilling the law? It becomes difficult to know the difference. What is it like? What does it look like to live the law differently? And who gets to decide that? And in all these tough questions and arguments, leaders and people citizens and foreigners and Jews and Romans and even families are set against each other as they struggle with what it means. So then in today's time, what does it mean that Jesus has reframed the law? Maybe it looks a little like this. We've come so far in science and math and in discovery. And this has caused us to look at the world in vastly different ways. When is a human life truly a human life? When it's conceived? When it can live on its own? Only after it's born? 
When is it our right, or is it our right, to mercifully take that life? Either before birth, or for a number of legitimate reasons, or when someone's going to die, and it might be the difference between making them live a prolonged life that's painful and long and costly versus going peacefully and quietly. Or maybe because they've taken someone else's, and so we take theirs. When or is it ever right? There are questions and debates about LGBTQ and global warming and our consumption of the earth destroying creation and stem cell research being about playing God or manipulating life. These are questions and tough debates about our faith and what these laws mean. And there's questions and debates about religion, even in amongst Christians. Who is right? Who is wrong? Does it matter? What's the purpose of our faith? Is faith all about salvation, or is it also about living on earth as God has commanded us? And what has God commanded? What does the law mean for us now, when we don't even understand Christ's decisions or words for ourselves sometimes as we read them in Scripture? So I think one thing we can all agree on, in some ways, faith is very tough, it's difficult, and it does not always bring peace in our culture today. And yet, Christ did not come to intentionally set us against each other. Christ's words in today's gospel aren't to incite fighting on purpose, but to say that because of why Christ has come, fighting will come as well, rather than peace. People will argue. Because it's not just about the law, but equally about God's love and relationship. And so then it becomes hard. We live in the gray spaces. It's going to challenge us daily. It's going to cause us to wonder constantly what would Christ do in this particular situation? What is the most loving? What is the most serving for my neighbor? And this is when Paul's words become incredibly important. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? Paul says, no, that's not the purpose of grace. The purpose of grace is to comfort us when we know we cannot and will not get it right, when we have to make a decision and we're not sure, when we're faced with these challenges in our faith and we don't truly know how to live them out. Grace will abound. And because we are baptized in Christ's death and we do die, we are also baptized in Christ's resurrection, so we will live forever with Christ. So if we truly hear this today, we truly hear that Christ is not here to cause us to fight, but we might. And God's grace does not excuse our actions, especially when done with no regard for the law. But Christ has come to turn the world a little upside down and cause us to question how we live. Christ has ushered in a new covenant that will be hard to understand and live out. Christ has, Christ has also come to usher in God's grace. When we get it wrong, when we fight, when we don't know what the right choice is, when we just don't understand. And Christ has come to remind us that God's word is intended for love and relationship with God and with each other. So let's not fight with one another, or judge, or forget whose we are. Let us live in the knowledge that Christ has come and come for all to be the Prince of Peace.